Fight fans, welcome to the PBC Podcast, brought to you by Premier Boxing Champions with your host, Kenneth Buhari and Michael Rosenthal. Welcome everyone to the PBC Podcast. I'm Kenneth Buhari. And I'm Michael Rosenthal, editor of USA Today's Boxing Junkie. We want to thank you all for joining us once again. Fight fans are still coming down off the high. That was last weekend's Pacquiao versus Ugas bout. We're going to take a look back at that entire Fox Sports pay-per-view card. And on this week's show, we've got WBA World Welterweight Champion, your Dennis Ugas, with us. Plus, WBO World Super Bantamweight Champion, Stephen Fulton Jr. Of course, Mike and I will go toe-to-toe later in the show. And this week, we're going to share our top five favorite Manny Pacquiao bouts. But first, we're going to discuss one of boxing's biggest stars, Jake Paul. That's right, folks. (laughs) Paul takes on... Former MMA champion Teron Woodley this Sunday, August 29th on Showtime pay-per-view. Mike, these kind of events are so polarizing. What's your take on these kind of matchups? Well, I was just kidding when I went, eh. Um, <laughs> as I said before, I'm, I'm a capitalist, supply and demand. If there's a market for such a thing, I'm okay with it. Uh, at the same time, it's there's two sides of this. I, I think about yeah. the real real boxers, guys who've toiled in the gym and anonymity for X number of years without making a fraction of the money that this guy makes, uh, and that bothers me. Uh, again, though, he and his brother have something that people are willing to see, so it sort of is what it is. I try to I try to look at it as something separate from boxing, so that is what it is. And boxing, we know what boxing is. Yeah, I mean, what about this one in particular, though? I mean, this fight against Woodley. Are you intrigued at all by it, or it's more of the same in your eyes. Well, I, well, it is more of the same, more or less. But I have to admit that I'm mildly interested, and intrigued by it. Uh, it's like a like a passing a car wreck on the freeway. You have to take a peek as you go by. Um, I'll give the Paul brothers this. They're they're trying to do it the right way, from what I understand. They're, yeah. they're trying to learn the fundamentals. Uh, and I'm a little, especially with Jake, I'm a little curious to see how he evolves and and when he'll bite off more than he can chew, which is coming at some point probably sooner rather than later. Uh, he's learning, but obviously still very, very raw. So uh, I'm interested to see what happens in this. Fight. Yeah, me too. Uh, you know, I like you. It, it, I see, I sort of see it as Paul. Uh, it seems like he's taking the sport seriously. And to be fair, it's only what his third or fourth pro bout. Fourth, so fourth, yeah, fourth, I guess I shouldn't really knock him for his opposition. And it's, and it's an intriguing one. Um, I got it. I'll be watching. I, who, who do you think wins? Well, I asked one of the guys at our sister site, MMA Junkie, about Woodley. He said Woodley is only a little bit more proficient in terms of boxing than Ben Askren, who was, uh, mm. Paul stopped in one round the last time out. Uh, but Woodley has more power than Askren. Apparently, he can punch. Uh, I'm guessing the guy can hurt Paul if he connects with the right punch. Uh, that said, Woodley's background is, if I understand it correctly, is jujitsu, jujitsu, yeah. which is grappling. Uh, it's not boxing. It's not stand up. You know, doing you know fighting stand up. Uh, he's probably no better at boxing than Paul is, and he's naturally a much smaller guy. He's only five nine, I think. Paul's like six one, naturally heavier. Uh, I think Paul's going to win again. Mm. I, I'm with you on this one. I think Paul might knock him out uh, early. In fact, and. <sighs> For those who are who are sick of him already, you're going to be really sick of him uh, if that happens. But I, I have a feeling about this one. I think he's doing all the right things in the gym, and I, I don't think Woodley has any idea what what he's walking into. All right, we're going to move on from the hot takes and and right to our guest representing a new era of Philly boxing. He is the undefeated. WBO World Super Bantamweight Champion, and on Saturday, September 18th, he defends that title against WBC champ Brandon Figueroa in a title unification live on Showtime, Stephen Fulton Jr. Stephen, first things first, did you catch the Pacquiao-Ugas fight over the weekend? And if so, what were your thoughts? Uh, I caught, like, little bits and pieces of it because I didn't, like, fully order it. Not saying I screamed it illegally, but when I went to <laughs> when I went to uh, order it, it was like messing up on my end. So gotcha. I was just watching it like little piece, pieces and bits of it from gotcha. somebody else's. But what I saw was, you know, a legend that just really need to like retire at this moment. 
I feel like he, he's done it all. So I just think he should retire right now. It was a good fight, though, all around. Yeah. Good fight. What what made you say he needs to retire? Did he just look slowed down to you? And Yeah, I mean, as you get older, your body would never give you what you used to and what, what you know that you can do. No matter what, uh, no matter what we tell ourselves, because I feel like a lot of this stuff is boxing ninety percent mental. So no matter what we tell ourselves, the older we get, our body still won't allow us to do certain things. And that could be a case in his aspect as well. So I feel like you got to know when to call it quits. Not that he like took any like crazy punishment, but like. It's time now that, you know, Ventura, I, uh, he's a senator. It's like time to venture off to other things in his life right now. There you, know, you go. With his family and everything. What'd you, what'd you think of Ugas' performance? I think, I still think, like, Ugas is a good fighter. I just think that the respect level is going to be a little cautious on what he's going on. Boxing smart. Right. Who would you like to see him fight? Do you, have you thought about that? Spence. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, that's that's a, a that's the fight everybody's pointing to. So back back to you. Um, how how is camping going for your upcoming unification against Brandon Figueroa on September 18th? Everything's going good. I actually just got out the gym, so everything's going great for me. I feel good. My weight is coming down. I'm just in a happy place right now. I'm just ready to get it on at this moment. Good to hear. Did did the date change from September 11 to September 18 affect anything at all? No. Yeah, actually, it was like, damn, I get another week to train? It's cool, but <laughs> if I need to touch up on some things, I can go and touch up on some things. Yeah, true. Now, Steven, you're a student of the game. Assess Figueroa for us. What does he do well? What what doesn't he do well? Uh, he brings the pressure well. He switches up well. He uses his angles when he's in the inside a little well. He uh, tries to overwhelm a fighter, uh, such as my 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 style, I believe. He tries to overwhelm fighters of my style. Mm. Uh, mm. He 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 does this little thing where he grabs you and 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 works the loose hand well. But he has a lot of good things that he does well. That he does well. What about that, that he doesn't look, do so well? It may well. look ugly. It may look ugly to me, or we may say like, "Uh, we know he, we can beat him," and this and third, but he's good at what he do. No matter yeah. what we say, he's good at what he do. Makes sense. Were you uh, were you surprised by his performance against uh, Lewis Neary, who he knocked out? No, I wasn't surprised by it at all. Neary's yeah. small. I, I knew like eventually. You can see it in, the, in those rounds that eventually he wasn't going to be able to keep going on, throwing a lot of punches, and he he, he tried to stay there at first, and then he he retreated to trying to box. Yeah. That's why I don't know why he left. Uh, Eddie Renuso when yeah. he, when he said that he had him doing a lot of defense and movement, but <laughs> it showed that you should have stayed, and they knew what they were talking about. All right, all right. Now, how much do you think facing? Someone like Angelo Leo, who's also come forward, uh, helped prepare you for what Figueroa brings to the ring. Honestly, I feel like it, it didn't help prepare what Figueroa is going to bring because I feel like they're, they're, yeah, they're both Mexican. They both come, but they come in different ways. Mm. Let's see. Again, against a brawler like Figueroa, do you expect to have to box more? Or will you stand your ground or will it be a combination of both things? I mean, September 18th, y'all going to have to see that. <laughs> right, right. Let's wait to see. <laughs> uh, well, just overall then, how difficult do you think this fight's going to be? Uh, things always is, are difficult at task at first. You know, we both will have to get in there and make the adjustments that we need to make. No matter what we see on the tape, no matter what we know we're seeing in, uh, in person, no matter what no anyone tells us, we still have to get in there and make the adjustments. It would definitely be difficult for both parties. Got it. Um, why do you believe you're going to have your hand raised in the end? Because I believe I'm the better fighter. I know I'm the better fighter. Now, Stephen, according to reports, Raiz Ali will, will be on the undercard. Um, what are your thoughts on him as a fighter? 
I really don't have any thoughts on them. Is is your focus just just on uh, Figaro right now? Yeah, my focus is on the the one on the box. I, I, well, I got to ask you this then, because, I mean, the 122-pound division is, is so stacked. If you could, who are your like your top five 122-pounders? I, I, I'm assuming Fulton's number one, but who are some yeah. of the other guys in, in, in the division, two two through five, in your opinion? Like, currently? Currently, currently. Me, I'm going to put Brandon in, and you, you got to put him in there. Yeah. Uh... I would pick uh, Dave Ramon. He's still acting. He, he's coming on back. Good fighter. Yeah. Uh, that last slot is just open for me right now. I can't pick Paisa on him because we just seen a little bit of him. And I mean, the first fight that I seen him on Showtime that August first, who did he hold any fight? I'm, I'm yeah, trying to remember. It was barely punched. The kid was barely fighting. He, he just was like, that was any fight. I can't yeah. believe it with that type of fight. The, the second fight, that was a, it was a, it was an okay opponent, but it took him a while to get him out of there because he don't know how to set up the knockout. So it was like two fights he was going to be saying he got the knockout, but it was like, we up to you forget what we up to that, that knockout looked like. Yeah, it only takes one punch and two always to get her when it takes. Like, even in the British Airways, a very fight. How was it looking before it knocked out? It was a little sloppy, you know, it takes a little bit. A little like, uh. But the knockout over, overlooked all of that. Mm. So that last slot is open for me right now. I don't, I, I, I probably had to pick somebody from back in the day. Steven, a lot of uh, folks. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, who do you think would need to be maybe? The the guy no, from my phone? Oh, you did? Yeah. I said me, MJ, MJ, MJ. Okay. Then Figueroa? Yeah. Roman? I said Roman. Uh, geez, that, that number five one is tough. Exactly. That's a tough one. <laughs> the, the people I just named are number one, two, three, and four for the Ring Magazine. How about Carlos gotcha. Castro? Did he just move, did he move up? Yeah, he moved up. I think he was at 126 for his last fight. Yeah. So it was like, I never even seen him fight. I didn't even watch that fight. I never, ever, ever seen him fight. So he looked good. Yeah. He looked good. Yeah, he did. Yeah, I never seen him fight. Steven, a lot of people... Uh, would love to see you fight Naoya in a way. They believe that's the dream fight. Would you agree with that? I mean, I feel like it's a good fight, but I feel like people are so used to doing what they do at 15 and 118 that if you come up, you won't have the same power and skill, just like near it. Right. I mean, we look at them like the monster and all that that they call them, but it's like, if I'm being honest right now, all of those, all of those aspects and things change once you get married with somebody. That's skilled as well. Not taking anything away from anyone he fought. He definitely fought, you know, no, no need to go there. But if he fought him in his prime, would have had this hand. So it's like, right. it's a, that's a good fight. I don't, I don't think it was, I want to say it was, it's my dream fight, but it's definitely a good fight. Right. Well, you mentioned you mentioned the size, him moving up in weight. So I was going to ask, what advantages do you think you have over in a way? Why would you beat him? I'm, 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 I'm taller, I'm a longer fighter, I'm smart, I'm fast, I'm just as fast, and the, the strength is definitely there. It's just or, it's overlooked, or should I say underlooked. <laughs> well, he, I, I think a lot of people saw it when you fought Angelo Leo. I mean, you're pretty big for a 122-pounder naturally, just the way you're built. How much longer do you see yourself staying at the weight? Probably time I become a little I know this. So, this so it's a couple that. more fights, hopefully, right? Yeah. Now, this might sound um, crazy, but if you do move up to 126, have you ever given consideration to fighting Gary Russell Jr.? I mean, the first person I would like to fight 
I like that fight. I like the never fight. That's a great style matchup between the two of you. Um, mm-hmm. But but getting back to your fight on September 18th, you've you've already beaten what like nine undefeated fighters. Um, you have wins over Le- Leo eight. Okay, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, you you have wins over uh, Leo uh, Kigai, Adam Lopez, uh, Josh Greer. Um, if you beat an undefeated champion Brandon Figueroa, uh, you may just be fighter of the year. Uh, should Stephen Fulton Jr. be on pound for pound list? Uh, I feel like it depends on how I, I beat this fight. That, that should be determined. But I feel like some people will put it on the list, some people won't. Me, personally, I feel like I, just, I would deserve that. Uh, because that means I would have beaten the WBO champion, which was Leo, right. and then beaten the WBC champion, which was the so I became world champion, then became unified in the same year. Yeah, that'd be that'd be impressive. Definitely a fighter of the year candidate for sure. So um, we are looking forward to September 18th. Stephen, again, thank you for taking the time out to join us. We don't wish you all the best, of course, on fight night and, and can't wait to catch up with you afterward. Appreciate that. Thanks. All right. It's time for the week in review. Now, last Saturday, nearly 18,000 fans packed the T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas and hundreds of thousands more watched on Fox Sports pay-per-view as boxing legend Manny Pac-Man Pacquiao took on your Dennis Ugas for Ugas's WBA World Welterweight Belt. And those fans watched in shock as Ugas outboxed and outfought Pacquiao to win a unanimous decision and retain his title. There's so much to go over here, Mike. Let's let's start with the action itself. What did you think of the fight? First, I'm happy to say that my worst fears were not realized. You know, Pacquiao turns 43 in a few months. He'd been off for a couple of years. Ugas is really, really good. I thought there was a chance that the legend would get beat up like so many once great fighters have been, you know, late in their careers. That did not happen. He was competitive. He didn't get hurt. That's a positive. The negative is that he wasn't the Pacquiao who beat Keith Thurman or the Pacquiao uh, that we've known for so long. He didn't have the legs, which he acknowledged afterward. He said they were tight. Uh, I have to think that has something to do with age, but who knows? Uh, Anyway, in spite of that, he managed to be competitive. He still has the hand speed. He still has the ring acumen, and he was fit. I mean, 800-plus punches at his age is pretty pretty remarkable. Uh, That made the fight interesting. It It was definitely an interesting fight. Yeah, it was. I thought it was a good fight. Not a great one, but but a good one fight. Uh, Ugas maintained control. He stuck to his boxing. He stayed disciplined. And with each passing round, you could see how effective that jab, his size, and, and his reach were. Uh, not to mention uh, the right hand. Could Pacquiao have done anything different to change the outcome? Not really. I don't think so. Uh, if he can't move side to side, in and out like he used to, he basically did all he could do. Um, I think he might have beaten Nugas if he had his legs, but he didn't. Uh, bottom line, I think this was about the best Pacquiao could have performed under the circumstances. So, no, I think he did. That was it. That was the best he could do. Yeah, I, I'm not sure Pacquiao could have done anything different either, and not without paying the price anyway. I mean, he's not as reckless as he once was. He did take some risks in there, but there was a lot of risk associated with that, which sort of leads to my next question. Was a stoppage victory possible for Ugas? Well, of course, it's it's always possible, but I, I really don't think so. He landed some good, clean shots, particularly that wide right he just kept throwing. Uh, at, you know, toward the end, Pacquiao kept his left hand up, and he blocked a lot of them. It's still a lot of those punches landed. Uh, so say what you want about Pacquiao's legs or his performance in general. The guy, the guy enter, entering the ring, entered the ring in incredible shape. Uh, that mm-hmm. obviously helped him absorb everything that Ugas threw at him. And while Ugas is a solid puncher, that's really not what he's known for. So uh, it's sort of like I think he also did the best he can do, which was really good. Yeah, it, it, it certainly was. And I, I believe if he could have put more punches together and continued to dig downstairs, there might have been an outside chance of a referee stoppage. But like you, I, I didn't think it was likely. Pacquiao was still tough. You know, perhaps if it was a 15 rounder because Manny looked a little worn down by round 12, but, oh, yeah. you know, not in those 36 minutes. How about if it was original opponent Errol Spence Jr. in there against Pacquiao? What do you think would have happened? 
Well, obviously that's hard to say because every matchup is different. I'll, I'll say this though, if Pacquiao fought Spence and Spence landed punches like the ones that Ugas did, I think the outcome might have been different. Uh, my worst fears might have been realized in that scenario. Yeah, yeah, I, I tend to think so. In fact, I think that uh, Arrow probably stops him. Yeah. Um, I mean, he had he has hard to believe he has a better jab than than Ugas. He certainly throws a lot more punches. Is well conditioned. He's got that mean streak in the ring. So I don't think it would have turned out too well for Pacquiao. Who would you like to see Ugas face next? Well, the floodgates are open now, aren't they? I, I want to yeah. see him fight all the top guys, and obviously he's earned that right. Um, the obvious first choice is Spence, who was supposed to have fought Pacquiao. Um, if he's healthy, I don't see why that fight, which is a title unification fight, doesn't happen yeah. late this year or next year if Spence's eye needs more time to heal. Uh, otherwise, his top challenger is Jamal James. Maybe he goes that direction first. Mm, that's interesting. Um, and to be clear, James is a threat to Ugas. I mean, James can beat Ugas. He's a re- also a really good fighter, so I like that matchup. Um, I think either way is it, it makes sense, but I think everybody would like to see uh, Ugas and Spence. Yeah, I think so, too. And I think that is the fight. Obviously, a lot depends on when Spence um, can return. But I tell you, if if Errol can't, I'd like to see Ugas versus Keith Thurman. Um, I, I really like that style matchup and, and uh, you know, an opportunity for Thurman to, to get back in the mix and for uh, Ugas to stamp himself. I mean, you beat Pacquiao and Thurman back to back. That's that's yeah. one hell of an impressive resume. Speaking of Pacquiao, what's next for him? Should he retire? So I'll say it again. I hesitate to suggest whether anyone should give up something that they love doing. Uh, but yes, I would like to see Pacquiao walk away. This would be a great way to go out. Um, again, he was competitive at 42 years old against an elite opponent. He didn't get hurt or embarrassed like some other great fighters have in their final fights. I'm thinking of what Pacquiao did to Oscar De La Hoya. Um, we can speculate why he didn't have his legs. I guess that's happened to him in the past. Uh, I'm not sure. I have to think it has something to do with his age, though, again. Uh, why tempt fate? I just think it's time. I'm grateful, personally grateful as a fan for all the years, all the great fights that he's given us as fans. Uh, and I know I'm not alone. I just think enough is enough. Don't tempt fate. You've done so much. You don't need to fight anymore. Yeah, you know, I, I agree with you. Look, can Pacquiao still beat some guys in the top 10? Oh, yeah. Perhaps, you know, the lower part of that list. But he's not going to get better. Uh, from here on out. In fact, he's likely to get worse. I don't see any reason for him to take unnecessary punishment. So, you know, I'm with you. Look, he's proven what he needs to prove in the sport. I'd love to see him maybe take an exhibition in the Philippines or just just outright, you know, hang him up. Yeah, you know, and uh, just leave while he has his faculties um, intact. I don't know if there's much more that he can accomplish at at this point. Now, in the co-feature, a battle of former world champions. Robert the Ghost Guerrero won a 10-round unanimous decision over vicious Victor Ortiz in a welterweight scrap. What were your thoughts on that fight? Well, as I wrote in my column, post-fight column, I have a lot of respect for both of these guys. Uh, they obviously put in the work for this fight. They fought as hard as hell uh, in, in what was a competitive fight. But that said, it was a little bit hard for me to watch that fight because I remember when they were at their peaks, these young, athletic, dynamic guys, um, they're just not those guys anymore. The fighters I saw on Saturday night were fit and determined, but a lot of the traits that got them to the top just weren't evident. Uh, they just leaned on each other and wailed, yeah. away, wailed away the whole fight. <laughs> uh, one of the broadcasters said it's safer to be inside than outside, which made sense to me. Uh, I think that may be one reason that they did that. Um, I just think they were most more comfortable there. Anyway, it was a competitive fight, just not what it would have been if they'd, you know, met a few years earlier. Yeah, and I, I thought that it would have been a little bit more exciting. It wasn't. I thought Guerrero proved that he still has that fire, um, but absolutely, you know, he's going to need more if he expects to uh, to challenge the elite. Where does he go from here? Well, I guess that victory sets up another high-profile fight for him against the guy that we know. Um, maybe he gets a contender this time, which is a little bit worrisome for me. Uh, I think he and his handlers should be careful about who he chooses to fight. He's a tough, tough guy, really tough guy. Uh, but I think he could get hurt against a next-level opponent. They should just be careful. Well, yeah, I guess it depends on how far up, you know, you, you, you know, in terms of levels. And style, too. Right. What, what about Ortiz? Where does he go from here? Well, he probably did well enough that he'll want to continue, I'm guessing. And he's a little bit younger than Guerrero. Um, He can say, hey, I've been off for three and a half years. That wasn't a bad performance, given the layoff. And there might be something to that. Um, 
I think he's in a similar boat to Guerrero, though. I would be, I would take it baby steps with both these guys. Be careful about who you choose to find out. Kind of feel things out because I don't want either of these guys to get hurt. And I think that's a possibility. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, you make some good points regarding age there and perhaps makes sense for Ortiz to jump back in the ring, not against a heavy hitter, not against someone too dangerous, but, you know, someone on the level of, of, of where Guerrero is at right now and sort of see where he's at. Um you know, coming off coming off this loss, let's move on. <coughs> excuse me to uh, one of the best fights I've seen this year, and Good and fight. definitely uh, a K of the year candidate as undefeated Mark Magnifico Maxio dropped former champ Julio Ceja in the first, then tasted canvas himself in the fifth, and then down on the cards in the tenth round scored a magnificent KO to pull out the vi- the victory. Mike, what were you thinking while you were watching this? It was just a really fun fight to watch. The ebbs and flows. That's the thing that makes usually makes a great fight is the ebbs and flows. Like one goes one direction, then it goes the other direction, then it goes back the other direction. Yeah. Uh, I thought Meg Sayo might take Seha out in the first round when he put him down. Uh, but then Seha bounces back and just destroys Meg Sayo's body, putting him down in round five. Yeah. Uh, those body shots were just vicious. And, Se- and Seha seems to be in charge. And you, as you mentioned, he was ahead on, on all three of the cards. And then out of nowhere, Mag Sayo lands that straight right. And then a short one. Is, you know, I think he was already unconscious at that point. Yeah. He was falling. Uh, and that, that was just such a great moment. Bad, obviously a bad moment for Seha. I guess he's okay now. But that was a great moment for Mag Sayo. What a way to end that fight. Yes, yeah, seriously. I, you know, like I thought Seha was on his way to winning, uh, you know, was. By round six or so, you know, well, yeah, you're right. Um, but I was really impressed with the adjustments Maxayo made in rounds eight, you know, nine, heading into into round ten. I was like, oh wow, you know, he's starting to box a little bit, um, and uh, and see how I started to wear down some. And no question, that power is real. Was that, in your opinion, the the KO of the year? It's a certainly a strong candidate when you combine the way the fight had been going, yeah. the massive stage. And then the dramatic nature of the stoppage, it was dramatic as hell. It's definitely yeah. one of the handful of uh, candidates for knockout of the year. Yeah, I, I mean, there's some good candidates this year. But for me, it's it's a leader just for the reasons you mentioned. The, the fact that it was a come from behind, Kale, right. you know, um, knocked the guy out flat cold. So the punch and the surprise does it for me. Now, this was a WBC featherweight world title eliminator. That title, of course, is held by boxing's longest reigning champ, Gary Russell Jr., is Maxayo ready for Russell? I don't think he is. I mean, I'm not sure anybody's ready for Russell. <laughs> right. uh, but I don't. But I, I don't think. I'm, I really don't think Maxayo is quite there yet. You know, he lost. I, I checked out the, the scorecards today uh, as I was preparing for the podcast. He lost rounds two through six on all three cards, and I think on the third card he lost like two through eight. Um, that's a yeah, that's a long stretch where he was really ineffective. And and like you said, he did make adjustments at the end, and he obviously came back and won the fight, which is which in a spectacular way, which was great. But um, and say I say is a good boxer. Remember, he was ahead on the cards when he was stopped by Guillermo Rigondeaux. So he actually sure. outboxed Guillermo Rigondeaux. So, but he's just not at Russell's level though. And I think it, I think Russell would give Mike Sayo all kinds of problems if say I can for most of the fight. Um, I would fight another guy or two at Seha's yeah. level and continue to develop before taking that giant leap in opposition. Uh, maybe he fights Carlos Castro, who stopped Oscar Escondón yeah. on Saturday's card. Or I thought of um, Nayim Bayar, uh, who's coming off that loss to Chris Colbert, but obviously he's still a name guy, good fighter. Yeah. Uh, something something along those lines. Well, bottom line, though, listen, if the guy earned a title shot, he's probably going to take it if he can get it. Um, I, if it were me, though, I would just maybe wait one or two fights. Yeah, I, I sort of see it that way as well. I think he's a fighter to a way too. I mean, he did show some vulnerability, um, things that I think Gary Russell would take advantage of. And Russell takes a good shot from what I can see. That's if you can hit him at all. Um, he, he's certainly a tough guy to knock out. Now, that said, I I would assume that Mike Sayo is going to be significantly better um, just – just coming off the experience of this fight, yeah. but I'm with you. I, I still wouldn't jump right into a fight with with someone as good as Gary Russell. You mentioned Carlos Castro. He was in the televised opener in another pretty damn good scrap. Uh, he was making his featherweight debut versus former title challenger Oscar Escondón. Castro had a rough first round. He was rocked late, but he found his footing, boxed well, and then put Escondón away in the tenth and final round. Mike, what did you think of the fight? Another really fun fight to watch. Escondón is just a little beast, isn't he? Yeah. Um, I thought we might be in for an upset early in that fight. Uh, but Castro, as you said, Castro took control and ended up with the knockout. 
Uh, I really appreciated S. Condone's effort, particularly because he was two and four in his previous six fights. Uh, that little that little dude came to win. I mean, he really came to win and, and entertain the crowd, and that's what he did. Uh, and of course, Castro got the job done as expected. It was a good fight. Yeah, it certainly was. What did you make of Castro's performance? I was impressed. Uh, he withstood that early pressure, which was no joke. Again, uh, he got wobbled once or twice. Uh, he showed poise and patience, uh, stuck to the game plan, picked Escondone apart from the outside, and he also held his own on the inside when Escondone got in there uh, and just gradually wore the wore the guy down. Uh, I think he was more or less done by round eight, and then Castro finished the job like a champ. It was a nice performance by him. That was a nice step by him. Yeah, I, I, I thought it was a nice performance as well. You mentioned... Uh, Mark McSyos, a potential opponent for him. Is there anyone else that you might be interested in seeing him fight next? I think he's a legitimate opponent for any of the title holders. Uh, he's ranked in the top five by three of the four major sanctioning bodies, so he's right there. Uh, he's 27. I think it's time for him. Uh, that said, I don't know whether there's a rush. Uh, I understand uh, that one reason he left top rank and moved over to PBC is that he wants to fight more often. Uh, maybe he stays busy, fights once or once or twice more, and then challenges for a title. Again, maybe he fights Magsayo. Uh, mm. Victory in that fight would build, you know, interest in him, which is also important. Yeah, I, I like the Magsayo fight as well. Maybe Ray Vargas, who we haven't seen in a while, and Tuxtat Nyambayar, who you mentioned as a, a potential uh, opponent for Magsayo. Now, in our prediction league, we do have an update. I'm pulling away. Uh, that's, <laughs> well, that's all you guys need to three know. Get, three game lead, but you're right. The year is, I mean, it's uh, just significant. You know, we're, we're entering the fourth quarter here, Mike, you're and you're right. going to need yeah, a, yeah. a Jordan like comeback. Um, I am 24 wins, four losses, uh, three draws. Mike is 21 wins, seven losses, and three draws. I mean, if you looked at my record, you might think I'm a former champion. If you looked at Mike's record, you might be like, I don't know about this guy. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm not looking back. <laughs> actually, you know what? I, I, I should be talking trash, but your record is actually really good. To, yeah, to, yeah, be, able, to, to be able to make that those kind of predictions and have that kind of that that much of a winning percentage is actually pretty good because yeah, well, I've done this on different platforms many times it's tough to to be right that that high of a percentage don't try to jinx me as we get into the uh, now, into now you're September gonna fall hard here. right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not it's not happening um anyway let's move on our next guest is the man we've been talking about fresh off his career defining victory over Manny Pacquiao last Saturday the WBA world welterweight champion your Dennis Ugas. Uh, your Dennis, first, congratulations on your victory against the great Manny Pacquiao last Saturday. How do you feel? I'm very emotional. Emotional. It's been a day very emotional. And I'm happy. I'm happy that I had a great fight against a legend. Everything was very excited, very happy. That's what made more important days of my life, so I'm very happy for the victory. What did that win over a legend like Pacquiao mean for you? Obviously, this type of fight doesn't come around often. Hey, I got the victory more grande de mi carrera. The victory more grande de mi carrera, and the moment more grande de mi carrera. And it was a great night for me, that I never forget. That's the most important victory in my career. For sure, the more important night of my life, and I never will forget that night I beat Manny Pacquiao. Yeah, we we won't forget it either. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, your Dennis. How did you celebrate your victory? No, todavía estoy celebrando, pero ha sido bien, 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 bien emocionante todo, bien, un sueño, un sueño. I still celebrating. Uh, that's what a dream come true. <laughs> Okay. Um, did you get extra motivation from uh, those who ignored your chances at victory, those who didn't think you were going to win the fight? Sí, sí. Yo dije, el que gane el sábado, el campeón de todo el NBA. Y gané yo y soy campeón. Todo el que no me dio crédito, todo el que no me dio crédito, pienso que ya lo silencié. Yeah, before the fight, I said, uh, the winner of this of this, this that night will be the real WWE champ. I made it happen. I beat Manny Pacquiao so that I take the credit. So all these people don't trust I can make it happen. Now they they now they are my followers. Now they are they looking for who is your Danny So I make it happen. You I I I you shut it down somehow. So I, I am the champion right now. 
That's right. Now, how were you able to adjust from being on the undercard to headlining a pay-per-view against a legend in front of his fans? Did you feel any extra pressure? Eh, bueno, fue, fue, fue un cambio grande, un cambio grande. Eh, Pelear con De Maidana a Pacquiao. Eh, pero yo era un guerrero, lo dije, compitiendo de los seis años. Y pude, 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 eh, la noche no me quedó grande, me quedó, me quedó a mi medida, perfecta. Uh, yeah, yeah, was a big, big change coming from uh, the, the supposed to be fighting with Maidana, Fabian Maidana, the uh, Maidana brother, so coming to the big state, the big fight. Uh, like I said before, I am coming fight, fighting from the Sister also. I am a warrior, I always be ready. I just can to say to you, uh, the people were thinking the stage will be mo more bigger than me. That that they 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 see it. That I do my best job, my my great job in the ring, and I make it happen. So the night was very very uh, perfectly for me. I was this is more bigger was the night is the most bigger was Georgia Nuga's name. Uh, you did, you definitely did your thing. Let let's talk about the fight itself. What were you expecting from Pacquiao going into the fight, and did he fight the way you expected him to? No, sí, fue un Pacquiao difícil. Te dio más de 800 golpes. Nunca, nunca me habían tirado más de 800 golpes. Eh, pero tuve buena defensa. Y, y sí, para mí tuvo fue. Eh, yo estaba esperando un peleador así. Yeah, uh, for sure. He threw more of 800 uh, punch. Never, nobody before lands too much. Punch, uh, fighting against me, and yes, that's the Pacquiao we're waiting, we're waiting for, a danger guy. So I did my job, and that's what happened. My job and my and my team pushing me to to the victory, and that's what happened. Your Dennis, what was uh, your game plan, and do you did you execute it exactly the way you wanted it to? Teníamos una táctica y la ejecutamos al cien por ciento. Ser paciente, escoger mi golpe bien, y lo ejecutamos cien por ciento. Yes, we execute 100% sure the, the, the tactical of the fight. The only point, the more important thing was be passion. We, we don't need to be hurry about to push in the technical. Uh, every, every round is coming, we, we, we put in the line what, what we expected to do. That's why I say in my uh, trainer's Mel Salah. So that's what we made. We were patient, thinking, punch by punch, and that's taking us for the win. Very good. There were some people who thought you could do more, maybe even stop Pacquiao the way you were beating up, beating him up there at the end. Did you feel you could have knocked him out if you put your foot on the gas? Pienso que que puede ser que yo tenía para más, podía hacer más, pero lo más importante era mi victoria. Yeah, uh, the more important thing I was follow the order from my corner is my Salah, right. and yes, maybe. Maybe the people, or maybe I think I, I can push the, the accelerator to make it happen or make the not down. But final of the day, I was following all the orders, and the orders making me take the wing. Yeah. Were you worried at all about the decision? No, aquí en Vega, la verdad, los jueces siempre han sido, los jueces siempre han sido justos conmigo. Yo confío en los jueces, y confío en los jueces, y, y así fue. Yeah, uh, sometimes you know the the people know all the different decisions or the scorecard from the Vegas judges. You know, sometimes they good, sometimes they make strange decisions. Yeah. But I was I was trust I was trustful in, in they will do a good job with with my job in the ring, and that's what happened. The, I, I was trust, so I feel good. I don't I don't feel too much worry about because I not did my job, and that they will bring me the victory. Your Dennis, you know, after the fight, we saw Pacquiao said he lost in in part because his his legs were tight and that you were one of his easiest opponents. What did you think of those comments? No, eh, eso de que él ha peleado todos estos años con grandes peleadores y sí, yo soy fácil, pero yo solamente hice mi trabajo. ¿Qué tú dices que tú qué? Él ha peleado con con muchos buenos peleadores. Mm -hmm. eh, yeah, uh, 
I respect, I respect what Pacquiao said, but he's saying it was easy, but let me tell you something. I only come to the to the ring to do my job, and I did my job. He mm -hmm. can say whatever he wants to say, but I come with a mission, and my mission was to take the victory. Yeah. Your Dennis, looking back on your career, it's amazing how far you've come. Uh, in 2014, you lost back-to-back -back fights to Emmanuel Robles and Amir Khan, uh, Amir Imam, excuse me. Uh, a lot of people thought you were finished at that point. What were you thinking back then, and how frustrating was it for you at that time? I fui tuve dos años y medio fue al boxeo, pero yo siempre supe que yo podía competir duro. No que ser un campeón, ni sé, pero siempre supe que podía competir. Yes, that was a hard time for me after the losses in, in row. But let me tell you something. I go my home sad, very sad for that time. I spent two years off, but always in the bottom of my heart, I, I, I think I am a warrior. I never think I will be champion of the best guy in the ranking, but I can say one more one thing. I weren't think I I was a, I am a warrior. I, I can't fight with anyone. That's that's for sure. I can tell you right now. I like that. Um, so after that, you changed trainers. You joined uh, Ishmael Salas. Salas. Uh, you also moved up from 140 to 147. Uh, were those the only other changes, or did you make more changes in your uh, in your career and in your life? Bueno, los cambios fueron muy buenos. Los cambios. Subí la a White Way y y venir aquí a Las Vegas. Eso fue, y tener mi hijo, esas cosas fue un determinante en mi carrera. Yes, uh, and the, the two year off, first of all, I, I want to say more important thing was my son, because in that that time off, I work in my family. Uh, my, my son, my firstborn, is coming with me. And secondly, the decision to go to Vegas and move to Welterway and come with Salas, they changed everything. That's I guess that's the more important or the more determination move I do in my life uh, before to beat Manny Pacquiao. That's great. You, you're, Dennis, you have a reputation for being a, a southpaw killer. Um, we just saw what you did against another southpaw in Manny Pacquiao. Do you feel that that will be a big advantage for you against another southpaw in Errol Spence? I played with the south, and I think that Spence is a great fight. Y mucha gente me va a dar oportunidades. Yes, yes, uh, you're right. I do great job against the Southpaws. And about Spence, for that fight will be a great, great fight. And I can say now the people will bring me some chance when I put in the ring with we are Spence too. So you, you, do you think that Spence uh, might be next for you? No, I think that I'm pensando porque se recupere. First of all, I want to say I am praying for his recovery as human. And if he recovery well, I will worry for him. I will be ready for him if if he, if his thing is the next one. Uh, what what challenges would Spence present if that's the guy you end up fighting next? Un gran reto. Un gran reto es uno de los mejores peleadores del mundo, vivo por libre. Uh, yes, he is the one best pound for pound in the world. Will be a great fight, and will be a good good gift for the for the fans. They're expecting a great fight, and Leslie will be a unification fight. So three titles in the land that will be great. Dennis, you fought Terence Crawford in the amateurs. You fought Sean Porter as a professional. Uh, there have been rumors that they may fight each other. If they do, how do you see that fight playing out? Who do you think wins? Uh, oh, my God. No, it's a good fight. It's a good fight between the two of the best weight in the world. How do you think it would be? I think Porter is always a competitor, a guerrero. Y una gran pelea entre dos de los mejores pesos huetes del mundo. Oh my God, as you say in Spanish. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he said he will be a great, great fight. Uh, we know uh, Porter, he is a warrior. He always looks forward. We know uh, the champion, uh, Terence Crawford. So it will, will be a great, great match.
Uh, last question from us, getting back to you. Some people have mentioned the possibility that you might fight Keith Thurman, and we just mentioned Sean Porter. You could also uh, get a rematch with Sean Porter, perhaps. What is what's your preference bet between those two? No, que yo quiero pelear contra lo mejor, que voy a pelear con el que el equipo mío elija. I just want the be the better one. Doesn't matter who is Porter Thurman. If my team will work on it, and that they will take the best decision to my next opponent. Very so good. if they choose one of them, I would take it. Very good. Jordanius, we know that you're in demand right now like never before in your life. <laughs> so we really, really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Best of luck going forward, and we hope to have you on the show again sometime soon. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Gracias. All right. Take care. It's time for Mike and I to go toe to toe. This week, we're going to name our personal top five favorite performances of Manny Pacquiao's career. Of course, this will be in ascending order. Mike, the floor is yours. Okay, let me preface this uh, as I normally do. Um, you know, we've done, we did a similar thing a couple weeks ago, but that, that was like fights that sort of made him into a star. These are just like five fights that uh, are personal favorites that just touched us in some way. I mean, there's so many. This was another hard list to do because with Pacquiao, yeah. there's, I could, you know, 15 fights I can name that I just loved. So anyway, uh, we both came up with five and here goes. So my number five is uh, sort of his uh, coming out in the United States was Lalo Ledwaba. Uh, I don't know whether you watch American Idol or America's Got Talent, but I yeah. thought of I thought of those shows and what makes them successful. It's the excitement of uncovering a hidden gem. Yeah. Uh, I remember everybody was talking about how good Ladwaba was, and he was. Uh, and Pacquiao just took the guy apart. Uh, we didn't know pa we didn't know Pacquiao before this, and suddenly we see this little fighting machine darting around the ring, firing off crazy quick punches from all sorts of crazy angles, and hurting Le Ledwaba in the process. I Means include you know on top of you know his ability to box and his ability to move his athleticism he just destroyed people with his power yeah. it was obvious in an instant that we had something special in this gifted filipino yeah for sure and that's why it's my number five as well that was oh, definitely uh, a, a surprise uh, that night when he beat led i but never heard of him didn't know anything about him i uh, just knew he was a late substitute and that led Waba was the undefeated man um and instead, what we saw was something special that night. I mean, he put on a show and he never stopped. Let's go to number four. Um, I'll, I'll start this one off. My pick is David Diaz, uh, who Manny stopped late. Now, the reason why Diaz is my pick here is is simple. Um, I thought that I did expect Pacquiao to win. However, I felt like he was sort of on his last legs. He hadn't looked that great Uh against Marquez the uh, the second time, and I thought, well, maybe he's starting to slow down a little bit, but he was rejuvenated against Diaz. I mean, he put a whooping on a very, very good fighter, a guy who had beaten uh, er Eric Morales and made it look complete, made it look easy, made it look one-sided. And so my number four uh, on the personal favorite list. Yeah, that sort of kicked off that amazing stretch that he had, uh, Diaz and De La Hoya and... Uh... I'd have to look at the order again, but uh, it's funny. You know, I remember a funny comment by Diaz after the fight, and, and he wasn't serious. Said, oh, and I was willing, I was winning at the time of the stoppage. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he was just trying to be funny. He, he got he got absolutely just destroyed. In That's, he's got a sense of humor. Yeah, yeah, yeah he did. Who do you have for uh, number my, four? My number four is uh, Miguel Cotto. Mm. Uh, I remember being really confident that Pacquiao was going to beat Cotto when they fought in 2009. Uh, Pac Pacquiao was so hot. You know, coming off those victories over Diaz, Oscar De La Hoya, and Ricky Hatton. And Cotto was only three fights removed from his knockout loss to Antonio Margarito. Still, Cotto was Cotto. I wrote I, I wrote that this would be the toughest test of Pacquiao's career to that point. Well, if that was the case, it was only on paper. Uh, I don't know if you recall, but Cotto took a lot of punishment. Yeah, in that fight. he did. So much so that he was on his bicycle, you know, pretty much the whole second yep. half of the fight. He just didn't want to take any more punches. Uh, and in the end, when he was stopped in round 12, his face was just a battered mess. Um, just think about that for a second. Pacquiao beat to a pulp one of the best fighters uh, of that time, a Hall of Famer. That was a huge victory, uh, especially the way he did it. Yeah, it certainly was. And it's not on my list because Miguel Cotto is also one of my favorite fighters. And it was really rough uh, to see him go out like that. I picked Cotto to win that fight. And I just remember somehow, sometime around the fourth round when Pacquiao dropped him again, I was like, what am I watching? Um, yeah. yeah, that was a brilliant, brilliant performance. He just, you know, he was at his peak. He just had everything that night. And I really think that 
that that may have been his greatest win. Either that or the Barrera victory, just beating those guys during the time that he beat them was was extremely impressive. Let's uh, let's move on to number three. Who do you got? My number three is the second fight with Eric Morales. Um, I don't know whether you remember, if the listeners remember, but Morales in 2005 was the only opponent to beat Pacquiao between 1999 and the first Tim Bradley fight in 2012, which, mm-hmm. which, which says a lot about Morales. You know, obviously we know how great Morales was. Uh, he defeated Pacquiao by a razor thin unanimous decision. So 10 months later, they did it again. Only this time Pacquiao made adjustments. Uh, and while the fight was competitive, he got to Morales more and more as the fight progressed, particularly with straight left, really hard straight left hands. Uh, and then and then he became the first to stop one of the greatest fighters of the era. Uh, that performance showed me that Pacquiao was resilient, that he could rebound from a disappointing loss and come back even stronger. Uh, and, of course, he stopped Morales again 10 months after that. Uh, yeah. Pacquiao was just superb at that point in his career. Yeah, yeah, he was. My uh, uh, Eric Morales is also one of my favorite favorite fighters, so I didn't yeah, love any of those fights it. except for the first one. Um but my number three was was Pacquiao's 11th round stoppage of Marco Antonio Barrera in the first fight. Uh, just an incredible performance from round one to round 11. I remember like he got off to a fast start, and I was like, well, you know, Barrera is going to settle down and and turn things around or at least make it competitive. But it never happened. I mean, he steamrolled Barrera, and you know, uh, for for those who who don't know, and I'm sure you've heard the stories. The idea of steamrolling Marco Antonio Barrera, heck, Barrera, I think his last fight was against Amir Khan, and that was like stopped on cuts in a competitive fight. I mean, it's just it's just ridiculous that he was able to do that to that guy when he was a top three or four pound for pounder back then. Such a brilliant performance. I don't know if folks realize the magnitude of, of what Pacquiao accomplished that night. Yeah, I, uh, I concur with you on that one. That's why that's my uh, number two. Uh, fight, which I can okay. I can go ahead and uh, explain why why I chose that. Um, you, you you touched on a lot of these things, but you have to remember how great Barrera was and how hot he was going into that fight. Going into that Pacquiao fight, Barrera had beat in succession Nassim Hamed, Enrique Sanchez, Eric Morales, Johnny Tapia, and Kevin Kelly. He probably wasn't at the absolute peak of his abilities, but he was pretty damn close to it. And he was, and as you said, he was just overwhelmed by Pacquiao, who won. I think he won every round, maybe lost one oh, round yeah. and stopped Barrera in the 11th. Uh, Pacquiao was just so fast, so powerful, and so busy. I mean, he threw a lot, a lot of punches back then that even the guy like Barrera didn't have the tools to cope with him. Uh, I, I thought Pacquiao proved in that fight that he could dominate a great fighter, which was a sign of his own greatness. Uh, and, of course, it kicked off the amazing series between Pacquiao and the great trio of Mexican fighters, Barrera, Eric Morales, and Juan Manuel Marquez. Yeah, and, you know... Um... You, you mentioned that he may not have been as at, at his absolute peak then. That, that's probably true. He was pretty close to it. However, I think that was he was as highly regarded then as he ever was at any yeah. point during his career. And it was Manny Pacquiao who knocked him off his pedestal. Now, my number two was that incredible knockout against Ricky Hatton. Uh, I did expect Pacquiao to win. I did not expect him to do that. That is, without question, one of the greatest knockouts I have ever seen in my life, especially uh, in a fight of that magnitude. And he was killing him from, like, the opening bell. I think he dropped him late in the first. He almost knocked him on the first round. He was he was putting a whooping on him then. It was only a matter of time. And then he just continued the beat down in round two. You know, no one, I repeat, no one, did that to Ricky Hatton. I mean, yes, Floyd Mayweather did stop him in, in the 10th round when they fought prior to that. However, you think about a lot of people, you think about what happened um, to Ricky Hatton um, before, after the uh, the Mayweather fight. He showed he still had it. He destroyed Paulie Malignaggi. I know Malignaggi is considered a light hitter, but the only other person I could think of who destroyed Malignaggi like that anywhere near his prime was uh, Sean Porter. I mean, Malinaji fought a very, very good fight against an extremely tough Miguel Cotto and and didn't come close to getting knocked out. And look what uh, Pacquiao did to him. So uh, absolutely number two on my list and and probably one of the my uh, favorite knockouts of all time. Uh, that's why it's my number one. I'll just go, <laughs> I'll go ahead and spill the beans. Uh, that's my number one. Uh, I chose this as my number one because, you know, along with so many others, I was just in absolute awe of Pacquiao after that fight. Uh, and I was there, I got to be there. 
Uh, no, Hatton wasn't a great fighter, but he was a very good, proven guy. Uh, and he was a really rugged, tough guy, you know, for the reasons that you mentioned. Uh, I thought Pacquiao would win that fight, but I didn't think Hatton would go as easily as he did. So what, is, what does Pacquiao do? He gives, arguably, gives us arguably the knockout of a generation, yeah. uh, which sent the fans at the M MGM Grand. It's just an absolute tizzy, by the way. Uh, I just remember gasps and jaws dropping, people looking at each other in disbelief as Hatton lay motionless on the canvas. Uh, I think Pacquiao might have been at his very best at that exact moment. Uh, and again, I feel fortunate that I was there to witness it. I will certainly never, ever forget that knockout. Yeah, me neither. And I, I still remember the replays. You know, it's good to see Ricky doing well because I thought he was seriously, seriously hurt um, by that shot. You could almost see his brain rattle inside his skull when you when you watch the replays in, in slow motion. That's how brutal um, that left hand was. One of the you know most perfectly uh, placed shots that you will ever see in the sport. Now, my number one personal favorite was. Oscar De La Hoya, the 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 TK over Oscar De La Hoya, and I'll tell you why. Um, I was very upset when that fight was made. I thought it was a cherry pick. I thought, why is Oscar bringing this guy up two divisions? Oscar, who had fought as high as 160 and won a world title there, if you believe he beat Felix Sturm, um, and regularly fought at 154. Now fighting this guy at 147, you know, someone who had just gotten to 135. Pacquiao had, had just got to 135 against David Diaz. So I thought it was a mismatch. I thought it was a cherry pick. And I thought, man, this is just this is just not right. And plus, it's it's a dangerous fight for, for little Manny Pacquiao. Why is this being allowed to happen, you know, uh, against a legend in Oscar De La Hoya? Well, little did I know. Um I remember watching that fight unfold and about round four, round five, I was like, oh my goodness, this is just amazing. I mean, he battered him just nonstop combinations round after round after round. It was brutal and uh, extremely impressive. Pacquiao was on fire that night. Absolutely one of my favorite performances because uh, I don't want to say it was a cherry pick gone bad, but he certainly proved me wrong and I was glad for it. Yeah, that... Uh... It's an unforgettable fight for all the reasons that you said, but I wouldn't choose that as one of my five favorites because I just thought it was just incredibly sad. I think Pacquiao did too. I think Pacquiao felt really bad after that fight for uh, what he, you know, he had to do it for what he did to a guy like De La Hoya, forcing him into retirement by, you know, not only beating the crap out of him, but embarrassing the hell out of him too. It was just kind of like, you just kind of, I just kind of wanted to look away a lot of that fight. So it definitely wasn't one of my favorites and it has nothing to do with, you know, if you know my story, I don't know. There's no love lost between me and Oscar <laughs> De La Hoya. Uh, but you know, I don't think really anything against him either. But uh, it's not a personal thing. It's just watching sort of a legend get beat up like, yeah, that. Beat down like that. Yeah, it was just it was just kind of like a, a sad thing. And again, I know Pacquiao sort of felt the same way. He's like, oh, man, I wish I didn't have to do that. It was like Marciano beating up Joe Lewis. Or, or, or Holmes Ali. Holmes, yeah, or that's what I'm thinking up, about. Holmes beating up Ali. It's kind of like, yeah, OK. Yeah, but yeah. but, you know, but that's the that's the fight that made him a superstar more than any other fight it sure did it, it it sure did and um for me i i thought man could he top this well i mean then he had that hat and fight so i certainly understand why uh you have it number one i mean so many great memories that this man has given us and and uh so many more great fights that we can't fit into this yeah. top five list no question i mean manny pacquiao one of the greatest fighters um that the sport will ever see i don't believe we'll ever see another eight division uh, world champion. Now, that is going to do it for this week's show. As a reminder, guys, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the PBC Podcast wherever you found us. We want to thank our guests, of course, as always, for joining us, and we want to thank you. So for myself and Mike, be sure to check back in next week for more boxing talk and interviews right here on the PBC Podcast. PBC Podcast.